my sermon passage is Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 18, to chapter 9, verse 1, page 657 in the Pew Bible. <clears throat> my grief is beyond healing. My heart is sick within me. Hark the cry of the daughter of my people from the length and breadth of the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with their foreign idols? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. I mourn and dismay has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. The word of the Lord. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. You know, sometimes I feel discouraged. And I think my work's in vain. Mm -hmm. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Over and over. Don't be discouraged. For Jesus is our friend. And if we lack for knowledge, he'll never refuse to lend. And yeah, I'm going to go on, even though we're going to sing it in a little bit. Because I need to hear this. And maybe you do too. So if you cannot preach like Peter, and if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to save the sin-sick soul. Let us pray. God of the prophets, by the power of the Holy Spirit, speak your word to us and seal it within us that we may heed your call. Amen. The end is near in this passage. The end is no longer on the horizon, but is virtually at the city gates of Jerusalem. So close that the prophet Jeremiah can taste it. Taste the bile of grief and sorrow and anguish. His own and God's own. Because, the prophet says, the people brought it on themselves. Judah, like Israel before it, is about to be conquered from without by an enemy from the north because of its social and political failures within. The Judeans talked a good game. They talked good God talk. They went to temple. They worshiped. They sang hymns and chanted liturgy and they maintained all the bells and whistles of worship. But outside the temple, they didn't actually walk the walk. They let things go to pot. They mistreated one another, fell to idolatry, and broke a covenant with God and with one another. And the prophet in anguish gives voice to the pain, his own and the Lord's. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? That's a rhetorical question. Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with their foreign idols? That is not a rhetorical question. And the answer to why, as is often the case, is fear. In fear, they ignored the law of Moses. They quit living right. They quit treating one another and others with love and respect, and they put themselves first. And politically, they allied themselves with unsavory characters, their leaders cutting deals and partnering with whichever nation or empire they thought would preserve their own power and position in the world. They thought in their own wisdom not the wisdom of the Torah, not in the wisdom of the very teachings that defined them as God's people. They had what looked like worship and what sounded like religion, but they had lost their way. And God's prophet Jeremiah wailed, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? More rhetorical questions. The metaphor of the balm of Gilead. Yes, there was balm in Gilead. That's where balm came from. 
It's true. Gilead, a region northeast of Judah, east of Israel, a little bit southeast of Galilee, which is in northern Israel. Gilead is where the plants were that produced a resin for making an aromatic balm, a specific kind of thick salve used to heal wounds. So yes, there was a balm in Gilead and physicians. By the way, it's actually pronounced Gilead, but that's not how we say it or sing it, so it's Gilead, right? Now the next rhetorical question is a different metaphor, but with an answer just as clear. Since there is a balm in Gilead and healers, why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? Why? Because they couldn't be bothered to repent or even listen. They were busy looking out for themselves, those of means anyway, and letting the poor suffer. And they were worshiping other gods. Some also did worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, but as we know, God is a jealous God. You can't stand to cheat. In, in the end, it did them no good. Now, I'm glad y'all are sitting down, if you don't know about this. Because speaking of cheats, as in false gods, as in people who say they worship God but are cheating on God by listening to false prophets and losing their way, there's a book out called President Donald J. Trump, The Son of Man, The Christ. And I kid you not. President Donald J. Trump, The Son of Man, The Christ. And the author passed out pamphlets about the book at a recent Trump rally in Ohio. It exploded on social media this week. The author, Helgard Muller, said he sent copies of the book itself to Hillary Clinton and to former President Obama. The paperback uh, version cleverly sells on Amazon for $17.76. $17.76. Yeah, I'll go ahead and process that for a minute. It's just mind-boggling, isn't it? <laughs> it's heart-curdling and mind-boggling. Mueller <laughs> said the Trump Organization had nothing to do with the book or its distribution but I haven't heard that the ex-president has condemned it either, as you might think a sane person would. Trump may think so, that he's some kind of divine himself. On Friday, somebody on his Twitter wannabe, Truth Social, posted this. Jesus is the greatest. President Trump, or rather President Donald Trump is the second greatest. And Trump reposted it without comment, which is surely his endorsement of that claim. President Donald J. Trump, the son of man, the Christ, is 326 pages of craziness. Mueller explains, during the presidency of President Donald Trump, it became evident to me that the prophecies about the son of man, as predicted by Jesus in the Bible, were, to a significant, a significant extent, fulfilled at the hands of Mr. Trump. The Bible speaks about two different Christs, or Messiahs. Jesus, the Son of God, is the one Christ, whereas the Son of Man is the other. This book will explain in depth how Donald John Trump's full name literally means the ruler of the world, graced by Yahweh, the Lord, and a descendant of a drummer. Upon reading this book, the reader will be captivated when they realize how President Donald Trump fulfilled most of the prophecies as the Son of Man. It speaks about end time prophecies and biblical revelations regarding President Donald J. Trump, the Son of Man, the Christ. It gets better, by which I mean worse. Here's a taste of the introduction. President Donald J. Trump is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Son of Man who will be seen seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. You have read that correctly. President Donald Trump is the Christ for this age, the son of King David. Prophecies of Jesus and all the prophets point to President Donald J. Trump as the son of man, the Christ. And after saying all that, I think I need a shower. And I may need to hose off this pulpit. Talk about unfruitful works of darkness. It sounds incredible, and it may be incredible. Uncredible. 
I saw where some Trump followers claim it's a plant produced by Trump opponents to make him and his followers look bad religiously, as if they need any help. Mueller himself, though, says he means what he wrote. All that madness helps inform another big news item of relevance to the church. It's decline. People are leaving. And some people are leaving because of the craziness like I just talked about. On September 13th, the Pew Research Center released some scenarios of what religion in this country might look like if present demographic trends continue. They projected that people who identify as Christian would decrease from 64% in 2020 to around 35 to 54% by 2070. And that doesn't surprise me, considering how Jesus and the language of church has been hijacked by extremists, and considering the rise of Trumpy Christian nationalism, which is nation worship and power worship, but not that Christian. Some people want to call them kinos for Christians in name only. No name calling, not for me, but I sure am with those who call them to account. The decline in church going and church doing does make me sad. Christianity as we know it could very well go the way of Judah and Israel. And for those people of God lost their way. And the marginalized and innocent back then got caught up in judgment and destruction as they always do and as they always will. It is enough to make us discouraged that there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to save the sin-sick soul. Sojourners Magazine, reporting on the decline of Christianity in the U.S., asked Christian writers, theologians, and activists for their reflections. The article by Mitchell Atencio was headlined, Seven Reasons Not to Freak Out About the Decline of U.S. Christianity. Or as I say, as I like to say, if you freaked out, freak back in. Atencio wrote that the responders to their question suggested that Christians who have been marginalized by white Christianity can teach the church how to live creatively without the power and privilege that comes with majority status. They also challenged Christians to consider whether majority status is worth pursuing and how changing U.S. Christianity's relationship to power might be cause for hope, not alarm. Well, here's some of what they said. Here's some balm. Vincent Lloyd, director of Africana Studies at Villanova University said, since Constantine, Christians in Europe and North America have been misled by the privilege and comfort that comes with occupying a position of power. In the minority, under duress, Christians will find it easier to access the truth of the faith, commitment to new life and to a new world. In 2070, Christianity will continue to shape our national culture, regardless of what individuals profess to believe or fill out on a survey. Christian concepts, practices, and ways of seeing and feeling shape who we all are, for better and for worse. Christians have a crucial role in making explicit the ethical and political implications of our Christian-influenced culture, how it orients individuals toward justice, how it challenges the wisdom of the world, and how it calls for conversion to a faithfulness aimed at the good, the true, and the beautiful. Lloyd went on, black Christians have long had the experience of living faithfully as a minority. And all Christians anticipating a future as a minority should turn to the lessons they have gifted the church. Amen. Tracy C. West, professor of Christian ethics and African American studies at Drew University Theological School said, this is an ethical issue of the use of power in community life, not the number of Christians. Whether in the majority or minority, can white American Christianity ever evolve beyond the perverse delight in humiliating and traumatizing vulnerable community members? Like relentlessly targeting brown migrant families, transgender children, pregnant persons and others to help maintain its fiction of superiority? Might the prospect of such a 2070 reality 
inspire those of us who are black and brown Christian believers in gospel liberation of the oppressed to build even stronger, compassionate, and just solidarities that reject fear, bigotry, and violence across racial and religious differences. Reverend Leisha Frazier, pastor with the Church of the Nazarene and organizer with the Poor People's Campaign, said, this is not a statistic to fear. It's to be expected. Christianity in the U.S. has for far too long been steeped in, if not birthed out of, white supremacy and far too concerned with colluding with political parties in an effort to maintain control using manipulation tactics. It does not surprise me that people are walking away from a Christianity that has been more oppressive than liberating, especially to those on the margins of society. However, while it is true that people want less to do with institutionalized Christianity, many still have and want to maintain a deep connection to God and to others who care about spiritual things. This does not bring me to despair because the early followers of Jesus were a minority religion. They were not perfect by any means, but they strived to create beloved communities around them in a political and religious atmosphere that did not favor followers of the way. Yet, it was said of them, they were people who turned the world upside down. I wonder if becoming a minority religion will refocus our priorities on loving God and neighbor, care for the poor, and justice for those being oppressed. Amanda Tyler, the Executive Director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and an organizer with Christians Against Christian Nationalism, Sign Me Up, said, the Christian calling to love God and love our neighbors endures regardless of our demographics. Christianity began and spread as a minority religion for centuries. One important difference from our beginnings and most of our history as Christians is that 21st century people in the U.S. of all religions and none have legally protected religious freedom. We should celebrate the freedom to act on our religious beliefs without unnecessary government interference, as well as the freedom to change religions. We should prayerfully discern why more people are moving away, are moving away from U.S. Christianity. Sadly, I believe that the ideology of Christian nationalism expressed in some churches is contributing to the, to the decline. Too many Christians are looking to and relying on government support for religion in ways that are harming our independence and integrity. Amid these challenges, our Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign remains committed to faithful action and the gospel of love. Dante Stewart, author of Shouting in the Fire, an American epistle, wrote, first and foremost, we should grieve the reality that Christianity in this country is something people want to disassociate with. Now, if the center of your faith is social, religious, and cultural power, then you will respond to these models in anger, fear, and resentment. If you believe your faith is neither here nor there, then possibly you won't care whether you become the minority or not. But if the heart of your faith is remaining open to the world and the possibility that faith is about curiosity and sharing sacred presence and stories, then these models may not be a shock but another chapter in this long faith story of Christianity in the U.S. Kevin Nye, author of Grace Can Lead Us Home, A Christian Call to End Homelessness, said, It's clear that there are significant aspects of U.S. Christendom that need to die. As a Christian, I believe in resurrection. Old things have to pass so that new things can emerge. I'm also encouraged by how many parables of Jesus describe the gospel as something small that grows and permeates organically like a mustard seed in a garden or a bit of yeast and dough. In that sense, the decline of the church in America is for me a sign of hope rather than something to fear. Finally, Marlena Graves, author of The Way Up Is Down, Becoming Yourself by Forgetting Yourself, wrote, my first thought is don't panic. Closely following Jesus seldom wins popularity contests. 
it can get you crucified given that it upends hierarchies. Many of the last shall be first. Originally, Christians were the minority in the oppressive Roman Empire. Those who want to follow Jesus are to be servants, not masters. Our sustenance is to do the will of God whom we serve, loving God, neighbors, and enemies in practical ways. Secondly, are documented and undocumented Latines in the black church considered? Aren't the disaffiliated primarily found among white evangelicals, mainline and Roman Catholics? Isn't Christianity steady, even on the rise in the majority world? Thankfully, the kingdom of God is not dependent on what happens in the U.S. That last thing, the realm of God on earth is not tied to the United States, as sad as it might sound to some, is healing balm for the rest of the world. In the meantime, I cannot preach like Peter, and I cannot pray like Paul. But I can and you can keep telling, showing, and living the love of Jesus and saying he died for all and all means all. So don't be discouraged. Jesus, the great physician, is our friend. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole, even the wounded church. Thanks be to God, there is a balm in Gilead to save all our sin-sick souls. Amen.